It's good to see you be here today. Look forward to our time of worship together. Highlight of our week. We meet with the Lord's people. Let's turn toward the middle of our book. Find the page, The Christ of the Cross. Let's sing this together. It changed the words where it says, till his trophies at last he lays down. He never lays down his trophies, but he brings them home, each one, for whom he paid the debt. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Christ of the cross, so despised by the world, as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear sin on our Calvary. So I cherish the price of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. On the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. To the Christ of the cross, I will ever be true, his shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday, for by his grace I am saved, and his glory forever I'll share. So I cherish the Christ of the cross, till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we come before you acknowledging our need of you in this very moment, that you by your spirit would turn our hearts, thoughts, minds, once again to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
as we've sung of his glorious person and work already. I pray now as we open your word that you would continue to teach us and just turn up the follow ground that these hearts that left alone become dry and clouds of dust without the fresh dew of your spirit and the refreshing revelation of Christ anew and again. We thirst and we hunger. And so pray that you would be pleased at this moment to, to quench that thirst and to satisfy us with the bread of life and the water of life. And we're mindful to give you the praise and honor and glory in our dear Savior, His name and your Son. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 27. And in the bulletin, you'll notice I put verses 1 through 27. That's because it's all one connected chapter. But as we know, don't hold me to it. We'll see how the Lord directs here. And I want to speak with you about wise counsel. Again, reminding us that the book of Proverbs is called the book of wisdom. And true wisdom is none other than Christ himself. That's who he is. He's a wise counselor. And all true counsel is from him. I know that we have people that have that title today called counselors, but they take the best of man's wisdom and try to help people through different difficulties and troubles. And I have to smile a little bit. It's like going to the doctor. If they really had a cure, you wouldn't have to go back. But the reality is that anything that man has to offer is temporary. Nothing like what we find in the Word where Christ is made unto us wisdom, that's the very first thing, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, that he be glory the glory the Lord. So we can perhaps, whenever going through difficult times or not knowing exactly how to handle certain situations, we can talk with one another, but our real need is looking to Christ. And I truly believe that's why the Lord brings trial and affliction and trouble in our lives as his children, that we never put confidence in this flesh or any human counselor. In fact, James in his first chapter writes, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all liberally. In other words, when this comes to this matter of seeking wisdom as it is in Christ, God freely grants that, has granted and does continue to grant it to his children. What a blessing, what a benefit that we have as his children that the world does not not know. That's why they pursue men's opinions and advices. Paul said that when it pleased God to reveal Christ in him, he did not consult with flesh and blood. And that doesn't mean that we can't benefit from what people say and know because even natural wisdom comes from God. Man would not have any talent in his field of expertise were it not that God had given that to him. But when it comes down to spiritual matters and what it is to know God and be known of him and how a sinner can be justified before him, then there's only one counsel that we need. There's only one counsel that we must have. And James, again, in his epistle, speaks of that wisdom which is from above. That Christ is from above. And his coming to this earth and working out in his life, in his death, that which was necessary to satisfy God's law and justice. That was wisdom. Left to us, we could never have discerned or known how it is that God could be satisfied. But Christ is that wisdom. In his life, living perfectly, the 
law and righteousness necessary and in his death paying the penalty. And so even here in the Old Testament, when we read these chapters, as we are here in Proverbs chapter 27, don't think of these as being wisdom of Solomon. I know the scriptures say that there wasn't any man on earth wiser than he was, but that was until Christ came. Even Christ said, there's a greater than Solomon that is here. And so as we read this, read it as being, as it is indeed, the words of Christ. Because the Spirit of God caused Solomon to write what he did here, but we know that the work of the Spirit is one work, and that is to take the things of Christ and to reveal them unto us. And so it begins very wisely when it says here in verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. But don't we spend a lot of time doing that in the flesh? Our sinful nature is to lay out how we think that we want things to go. And how many times we'll get excited because all of a sudden now everything seems to be falling in place. You ever talk to somebody like that and your world shattered and come apart and they're like, hey, I got it together. Well, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Again, we could be reading James here when he said, when you get ready to go to market, don't say that I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, but what? God willing that it will be so. And that's not just a platitude that people tend to tack on to the end of what they have already determined is going to be, and oh yeah, by the way, God will you know, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. It's easy to do that, especially in a modern world where we have so many means of getting things done, we become arrogant. And there it is, that sin nature, that depravity that's in our heart that determines ahead of time what we are going to do. If you're in a business world, everybody's promoting these little calendars. You get pop-up reminders on your phone and you've got your own personal digital secretary and you just feel like, hey, things are coasting along until the Lord blasts that gourd. And all of a sudden, you can have all the best plans and calendars and things laid out, but the determining of it is going to be of the Lord. And that's why the second part of this verse says that, for thou, that, that applies to every one of us, thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. How many times have you laid down at night, and there again is a system, people tell you lay down and write the top six things down, that you need to accomplish tomorrow and put them in order of priority and don't go to number two until you finish number one. And when you finish one, go to two. And if you get to the end of the day and you haven't finished that complete list, then you start over that night before again and, and reorder. That's called self-determination. But here it's very clear. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Man proposes, but God disposes. The only man, and we see this even pictured in the Lord Jesus Christ when he came to this earth. Don't you believe that what he instructed others was exactly what he was doing? You say, well, he was omniscient. He knew everything from beginning to end. And yet he lived day to day as a man. When he said, take no thought for tomorrow, for sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. This is our Lord saying this. He humbled himself and became a man and lived the perfect life as a man should live. And yet we fall far short. That's why he came, because he lived exactly as he instructed the others in order that he might work out that salvation on our behalf. Now, this doesn't rule out planning. I know some people don't like to plan, and so they're going to say, well, we're not to be thinking about tomorrow. We don't know what it's going to bring, and, and I don't know if you've ever lived around somebody like that, but it's utter chaos because as they float down life's river, things take place, and most of those kind of people, you're always having to intervene and help them out. 
because there is no plan, no thought. That's not the excuse here. But the other extreme is boast not thyself of tomorrow. Don't think that somehow because you have those plans laid out that all is well. In fact, I'm thankful in many ways that we don't know what a day might bring forth. Be careful of wanting to have foreknowledge. All it takes is for the doctor to say, well, you've been diagnosed with cancer and your whole world's upside down. What does that mean? Where am I going? What? Aren't you thankful as you look back that many of the trials which the Lord has brought us through, we didn't know anything about them ahead of time? Thankfully so. Or in our sin nature, we would lay there and fret and worry and wonder. I'm thankful that the Lord directs us one day at a time. Because to know even the evil that awaits us right now, if it were revealed to us five days from now, we would be frozen. We wouldn't know what to do with our lives. And so even in this, the Lord is merciful in that he mets out these things in our lives one day at a time, one moment at a time, as he's pleased to. But whatever he does, it's in order that our hearts and minds be on Christ, who is directing all things and not on ourselves. Here again is another bit of wisdom. This is wise counsel that if the Lord would teach us, oh, how we would rest. Rest in Christ. It's, it's not us holding him. It's him who has us in his hand. And he's clearly declared that there's nothing that could ever take us out of his hand. He's the great shepherd. Now, verse 2, let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. See, here again, it shows our own depraved nature in that we're bolstered by our own praise. And don't tell me that you're not like this. When you do something for somebody, if no one acknowledges it, you're going to bring something up in a conversation or by the way to where people are going to say, oh, I didn't know you did that or I didn't know that was what happened there. Because you've been in those conversations. You're talking about somebody else and praising them for something they did and all of a sudden you pop in and say, well, you know what? I'm the one that actually set that up. <laughs> That's just this just like in verse 1, it's self-determination. In verse 2, it's self-recognition. Such is our nature. There's only one worthy to be praised. And that is, again, the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. If there's any to praise, let it be unto the Lord alone. And I know this is difficult because sometimes you're caught off guard when people... Others speak well of you. In fact, that's what it says here. Let it be another and not thine own lips. But it's not that you're sitting waiting for another to praise you. But when they do, what do you do with that praise? You put it right back to the source of the one that is due all of that honor and glory. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. So let another praise you and not your own words. That's self-promotion. I was looking for another word, just like self-determination, self-promotion. That's what our nature is in pride. And I'll tell you, with modern technology today, it's not hard to praise yourself. It's like in congregations where they give people an opportunity to stand up and give a testimony. And they put it under the guise of testifying of what they've done for the Lord. But in reality, they want that applause. They want people to know just how zealous they are and how busy they are doing the supposed work of the Lord. Now here, when it says, let not thine own mouth praise thee, that's where we, we be silent. Unless the Lord himself gets the glory, may he cause my lips to be shut. Whether other men know it or not, all I can acknowledge and say is that if I can do anything to the honor and glory of the Lord, all the praise and honor belongs unto him. And it says here, a stranger, not your own lips. 
That's when it comes from an unexpected source, even from somebody that themselves, because we're all this way by nature. We all seek self-praise and self-promotion. So if any can speak well of one of the Lord's, even that is not of them. I say often, if, if the Lord does send an encouraging word for preaching the gospel to his sheep, that the Lord does that for our encouragement, but we're not to take that and begin to promote ourselves. Even when people say that we're blessed by a message, let that in itself go to the Lord. The good answer is, well, I thank the Lord that he was pleased to take such a meager means. You know, as Paul said, we carry in this the, the very excellency, the, the, the treasure of, of the excellency of Christ in these earthen vessels. The glory is not unto us, but it's unto the Lord alone. And so let our lips be silent when it comes to any kind of self-praise or self-promotion. But uh, truly all the praise and honor goes to the Lord. I had a friend that helped me one time when we were talking about this. What do you do when people want to compliment you? And, or you want to compliment others? Well, you can tell them that you appreciate them and what they've done, but you thank the Lord that he's so purposed. That's a good answer. I appreciate you. I appreciate how the Lord directed you to do that, but let's pause and thank the Lord together for it. That's a good answer. All the glory belongs unto him. So then we get into verse three, and, and these are like pearls on a string that all have their significance. None of them is exactly the same, but together they all bring glory unto the work of Christ in the hearts of sinners. Here it says, a stone is heavy and the sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. We'll read verse four as well. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? This has to do whether it is our own nature there are days where it seems like there's a weight on our hearts that unless the Lord is pleased to uphold us and strengthen us in those particular moments, that we would be consumed by it. Thank God that he doesn't leave us to ourselves. And I'm talking here about our place in the Lord Jesus Christ that by nature, as it says, a stone is heavy, and by nature the sand is weighty. We could not even bear up under our own sin because we carry about in these bodies a whole weight of sin that were it not for God's grace and mercy, it would certainly plunge us into hell. I know that you've heard me say many times when people say, well, how are you doing? <laughs> if we were to truly express openly the thoughts of our heart and the burdens that we carry around here, it would not only be a weight for ourselves, but a weight on anybody that else that is around us. And I often say, better than I deserve because I know myself to be that sinner, that unless it were for the grace of God, this weight, this stone, or like sand, I could not even bear up under it. But here's where I want us to think again of the Lord Jesus Christ. When it says that he was made sin for us, it doesn't mean he was made sinful, but imagine him having taken the entire weight of the sin of his people, and it was laid upon him. That's what God purposed, and by his stripes we're healed. What a glorious savior he is. And that's why he says, casting all your burdens, your cares upon him. We could not begin to bear the weight of this flesh and this sin before a holy God were it not that Christ has taken that 
as the sin bearer laid upon him, not put in him, but laid upon him all the way to the cross and never stumbling, never halting, never crying out as if it was too much to bear. It took exactly that kind of savior to be that sin bearer. So when you consider even for yourself, if God were to, by his spirit, truly open up your eyes to see nothing but the putrid pollution and weight of sin that is in us, just one person, we couldn't bear it. But that's where when he, at times, by his spirit, shows us what we are, that's not the full weight, but he does it that in our heart and mind we might then cast that burden upon the Lord and thank God that he is that faithful sin bearer. But no matter what that is, here in verse 3, at the end it says a fool's wrath is heavier than both of them. In other words, think about the weight that we carry, and yet by the Spirit of God, we look and see how Christ has borne that weight. I often wonder how it is that people live, and, I, and you know, you try to think back before the Spirit revealed Christ in you, how you lived. And it was only by God's mercies, I know that, but there's a whole world out there that has the same weight of sin in them. And all they can do with it is become angry. You realize that most people out there that are seeking psychiatrists and psychologists, it's nothing but suppressed anger. There's something that they are rebelling about in their life. It's suppressed anger. And the more they think about it, the angrier they become. That's what's called here the fool's wrath. A fool's wrath is heavier than them both. We're talking about somebody here that's left to themselves, who has no understanding of Christ being God's wisdom and no desire. And so here they find themselves in life. And you and I run into people all the time. They're angry. If you begin even to point them as a sinner to Christ, their hands out like this. I don't want to hear about that. They immediately lash out. Well, that anger, whatever they're manifesting toward you, is really anger toward a sovereign, holy God. And it's weighty. It says a fool's wrath is heavier than them both, heavier than stone, heavier than the sand, a weighty sand. Can you imagine jumping into a river with a big stone in your arms? Well, they, you're going to let go of that stone or you're going to drown. Same with sand. That's when they want to kill someone, they tie sandbags around their feet and toss them into the water. That's it. There's nothing but condemnation. See, our blessing and grace is that the Lord has taken all that on himself. He bore that weight. But the fool, here he is in his anger and really angry at God. And it's weightier than anything that any could ever bear. The wrath of any person against a situation or against any other person is really an anger against God. And that's how we're all born in this world, wrathful children. And we were, by nature, wrathful children. It's only been by the grace of God and the Spirit of God that Christ has lifted us up and, and taught us of himself and showed us that all that sin that would condemn us. He has borne himself. And so, verse 4, in connection with that, wrath is cruel. And anger is, when it says outrageous, that word literally means like a torrent. It's like someone in a wild stream where the current is rushing against them and they can make no progress forward. In fact, it only takes them further down the river. That's what wrath is. That's what it is to be an object of wrath. That you can't control it. You know, this is not just a matter of people saying, well, I'm just going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And I'm going to overcome this. You can't. This is like a, a torrent that is ever leading you toward death and 
toward condemnation. And in connection with it, that wrath, really, it says, but who is able to stand before envy? You know, when people are angry about situations, they're really envious. They covet something better. But isn't even that a rebellion against God that orders our steps? Something about the next time you get angry or I get angry. Stop pointing the finger out there. Let's let's look in here. That's why the scripture says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon what thy wrath. That's what's in here. There's nothing good in here. In my flesh dwells no good thing. And let's not be sanctimonious and think, well, I you know, ever since the Lord's taught me, I never get angry anymore. Really? You must be dead. I don't Lash out in anger and wrath like they used to. Again, if you have no sentiments like this, you're dead. Because any that are taught of the Spirit of God, they acknowledge this day to day. And so, again, wise counsel is for us to look and see how the Lord Jesus Christ himself lived his life. And I know people make the argument, well, he was God, so it's understandable. No, he... It's true, he was God, but the scriptures say that he was tempted and tried in all things, yet without sin. Just read through the Gospels. Take this as your homework. And go back and start Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And see how in the face of every opposition, when men were lashing out at him, and with their tongues seeking to destroy him, by their words say nothing about by their actions, he was daily the object of their disdain and their wrath. And yet none of that moved him. That as a man, he learned obedience, even though he were the son of God and was obedient unto death. See, that's him as the representative of his children. And if I'm his child, in these times, I thank God that it was for such that he came and paid the death because the envy of sinners, even against our Lord Jesus Christ, it was out of jealousy that they crucified him. They were envious that he would not give them the glory in any matter and that he himself must be the object of their glory. But that jealousy is, is tied to its friend is, is wrath and anger. So when others lash out at you for being an object of God's grace, what do you do? You take it to the Lord. You commend it to the Lord. But when you, yourself, or any situation, react in anger and wrath, you do not well to be angry and let the sun go down on your wrath. What that is is rebellion. That's saying, in essence, I'm going to hang on to this anger and wrath because I'm not getting what I deserve. I don't like the way people are talking about me. And it's to forget that it's for that that God could send you to hell. Just for that alone, whether you speak it or not. And if Christ had not come and borne that in his flesh, you'd be just like the very ones that you're angry at or jealous of. I know we all think ourselves to be living in this bubble somehow, but the next time when you go into work and someone else gets that promotion and you don't, <laughs> how that can just eat away like a, a gangrene in your heart unless by God's grace and spirit you bow and say, Lord, I thank you that you have me where you want me and everything is exactly the way you've purposed. And rather than be angry or wrathful out of jealousy of another, May my eyes be on the Lord Jesus Christ, who endured far more and was faithful unto the Father that he might save such a wretch as I am. And so, the reminder there that, again, we're looking at this self-determination, self-promotion. Here in verse 4, it's nothing but self-pride that causes us to lash out in anger and uh, be as others are, children of wrath or wrathful children. 
And the Lord purposes these things to cause us to see that there's no such thing as what they call progressive sanctification, where somehow this flesh is getting better and better, and you can get down in the pit with this flesh, and you could, when they understand mortify the flesh, is, is actually wrestling with it. I'll tell you, the more you wrestle with it, the more you're going to get a bloody nose, because there's nothing in this flesh that we could ever take on or change. It is what it is. It's in those times that we need to be utterly cast on the Lord and acknowledge that sinner that I am, yet it is for such that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. And so, moving on to verse 5, how we need rebuke. Here it says in verse 5 and verse 6, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So open rebuke here is better. Many are hesitant to receive rebuke. Again, that's self-pride. That when someone points out something in you, by the way you justify yourself, that shows right there. So now, now we're not only self-pride, but self-justification that we're going to answer in such a way as to protect our integrity, so-called, or our reputation of how we want people to think of us. But here, open rebuke is better. It's a good thing when the Lord causes people to point out in us those things that are faulty. Now, we don't necessarily like the way they do it at times, it's better when there's one that's one of the Lords that comes alongside and in kindness and consideration and prayerfully. It's like in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, when any man is overtaken in the fall, you that are spiritual, it says restore such a one. Well, how do you do that? But getting next to them and talking to them and pointing to Christ as one sinner to another. But we know that even those that are in the world. <laughs> I'll tell you, if you want to have any true view and evidence that we're no better than anybody else and that we're sinners just like anybody else, let the world look at you and speak of you. They usually put it in this way, and you've heard it before, I thought you were a Christian. Or how could you be a Christian and do that? Well, rather than push back and fight it, best thing by God's grace is to say even to them, I am what I am by the grace of God. That's not an excuse, but that's just saying, if it weren't for the grace of God, you're right. The Lord would be just in condemning me even for that. But another thing that I like to say when people pointed out in me is, I'm thankful you don't know the half. That's not original with me, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. But thank you for pointing it out. I pray that the Lord would direct my heart in this. So open rebuke is better than secret love. But that secret love is talking about there is that a person thinks ill of you and acts in a way as if you have no fault. And yet, in reality, they're harboring in them all of these thoughts about you. That's what it's talking about there, that secret love. It's, it's concealed. It's like people saying, I love that person. I love my children enough I could never correct them. You ever hear that expression? Or I love them too much to say anything. Well, you're not helping it's better to have that open rebuke than to hide any kind of thoughts and not speak them because you say, well, I love that person too much to say anything. There are a lot of preachers that preach this way. They will not stand up and declare unto sinners who they are before a holy God because they want to be loved. So here's that secret love. They're, they're wanting not to say 
everything the scripture says because they don't want them to be offended. And they themselves want to be loved. They want to be liked. So they, they keep quiet those things that they know are going to upset people. But when it comes to preaching this word and preaching the gospel, we dare not hide under the cover of love what God clearly declares concerning sinners. It's like one popular preacher said a few years ago when a journalist questioned them and said, well, I never hear you in your preaching ever mentioning sin. And the preacher said this. He said, well, why would I? Because we need to keep the message positive. Well, not only is that man deceived, but he's deceiving others. And we've got to declare, and it's not by beating people down. When it speaks here of open rebuke being better than secret love, it's talking about, again, declaring unto sinners who they are, but doing it in a way that I myself am one of those sinners. And I speak as a dying man to dying man. I speak as one sinner to another. That the only remedy is in the Lord Jesus Christ for either of us, but better that rebuke from the word than to set it aside and pretend like, oh, God loves you anyway, and all, all will be well in the end. That's not what the scriptures declare. And that's why verse 6, and that's about as far as we're going to get here, verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Who is a true friend? Well, we know there's none truer than the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he called his disciples friends. It's because he would lay down his life for them. But as a friend, the Lord holds nothing back. That's why when we read these scriptures, even what we're reading here, it, it shines a light on who we are. I would rather this rebuke in the words of a faithful friend as in the Lord Jesus Christ that would cause me to know who I am and cause me to look to him alone for my strength and help then just like a wound, just to pass over it and bind it as if everything's going to be okay when it's not. Now, faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's a mark of a true friend, that even though it wounds, there it is, the idea of loving correction, and the correction may not be pleasant at the time, and yet, by his grace, we're brought to be thankful. The chastening of the Lord, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. That comes through the hand of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll say it very specifically. There's no wrath in any correction that God brings to any one of his children for whom Christ paid the debt. Because Christ paid that debt. That wrath has been put away. But there is love in his correcting. And even though, as the writer of the Hebrews says, there may not be at the time a joy, yet when it brings forth the peaceful fruits of righteousness, that, that is the peaceful fruits of what Christ accomplished in his righteousness, that we would be drawn to him even through these corrections and not left to our own way. What a blessing it is that that Christ is that faithful of his faithful are the wounds of a friend to continually draw us back again and again to himself. That's why David spoke of it. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I always say the shepherd's staff is the, the stick. And that is to give good smack to a sheep when it's kicking up its heels and going its way. But then on the end is the hook. Thy rod and thy staff. The rod is the, the, the uh, wood, the staff is the hook on the end that draws that sheep back to Christ. It might smart when the Lord brings this to our attention and corrects, but at the same time, we give him thanks that he does not let us go. What is worse, as it says there, the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Beware when all men speak well of you. For flattery, again, we like to be flattered but it's the kiss of death. These cautions that we read here are 
warnings that we not be deceived in thinking ourselves better than who we are. I think about the kisses of an enemy. Think about Judas in the garden. When the sign that he told the Pharisees, the one that I take, hold myself and kiss, he's the one. That was the kiss of death. Absalom with David and uh, Ahithophel, some of David's trusted servants who, in the end, their kiss was nothing but a kiss of death. Who would not prefer that faithful wound of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though painful for the moment, than the multiple kisses of an enemy? I'd rather that sinners understand who they are before a holy God rather than deceive them and making them think that somehow all's going to be well when it's not. All right, we're going to draw a line at verse 6, and Lord willing, come back to verse 7 next time. We'll pause and meet back here in a few minutes.